This uh, hearing is uh, commenced on the uh, uh, economics of uh, dependence on foreign oil, rising gasoline prices. Um, in 1973, Americans were shocked by a sudden increase in gasoline prices and supply shortages uh, that were brought on by the Arab OPEC member states. Uh, and the price of gasoline rose from 38 cents in May of 73 to 55 cents in June of 1974. Uh, lines for refueling formed as supplies were constrained. But America responded. We um, largely moved away from the use of oil for electricity generation, going from 16 percent oil fired generation in 72 to 2.5 percent uh, today. Uh, we promoted energy efficiency and conservation. Uh, and um, most effectively, in 1975, the Congress passed and President Ford signed a bill which doubled the fuel economy uh, for the vehicle fleet in the United States from 13.5 miles per gallon uh, to 27.5 miles per gallon, a doubling of fuel economy for the vehicles we drive in America in 10 years. And what happened? Well, the dependence on foreign oil in the United States dropped from 46.5 percent in 1977 to 27 percent in 1985, a precipitous drop in uh, oil consumption in the United States. We backed out 4.3 million barrels a day of energy consumption as the fuel economy average for the American automotive fleet doubled in just 10 years. Well, today we are unfortunately faced with a similar crisis. Uh, because since 1986, uh, what we are seeing is a dramatic rise in oil consumption, largely related to the fact that uh, there has been an SUV light truck exception that has seen the average for fuel economy go backwards since 1986, from 27 back to 25 miles per gallon, even as the United States has pretty much led the way in deploying the Internet around the world, cracked the human genome. Here in auto mechanics, we have actually gone backwards uh, for the last 20 years, but with an increase from 27 percent to 60 percent, our dependence upon imported oil. If all we did in the United States was to improve our fuel economy average from 25 miles per gallon to 35 miles per gallon, we would back out all of the oil that the United States imports from the Persian Gulf states. Just an increase in 10 miles per gallon. And we can do that. As the price of gasoline now passes $3 and experts are predicting $4 a gallon gasoline, this becomes an even more serious issue. Because not only are we spending all this money to import the oil, but the money which is then spent is used by many of these countries to finance the terrorism, to finance the hate, which is then redirected back at the United States of America. It is the worst of all worlds for our country. If you are a family, only one car making $20,000 a year, $3 a gallon gasoline consumes almost 9 percent of the annual income of that family. For a family making $40,000 a year, $3 a gallon gasoline costs them 4.5 percent of their annual budget. So this issue becomes something that is very real for ordinary Americans. This is a lot of money. Increasingly, OPEC is able to tip consumers upside down and shake money out of their pockets because we do not have a national policy which is effective uh, to protect the consumers in our country. So this issue is something that is central uh, to the American well-being. We have to increase the fuel economy of our cars and trucks. We have to increase the amounts of renewable homegrown biofuels. We have to prevent gasoline price gouging during times of tight supply and high demand. Gasoline prices are at $3 a gallon right now. Experts say that $4 a gallon 
is right around the corner for the American consumer. I look forward to gaining the perspective of our witnesses on this issue. It is an, uh, an issue that affects our economy. It affects our national security. Uh, it affects uh, the very ability uh, of our country uh, to be able to deal uh, with issues both domestic and international. And so I don't think there can be a more important uh, subject. Uh, I think that it's critical for us to understand that, um, uh, that the time has now arrived for the Congress and hopefully for the President to begin to do something about this outrageous high-priced gasoline that consumers are forced to purchase and, as a result, make other choices uh, that deprive their families of what they need. The time for the, uh, the uh, opening uh, comments by the Chair has expired. I turn to recognize the ranking member, the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Contrary to popular belief, this Select Committee is not just about global warming. Energy independence is also in this panel's title, and I am pleased that today we will be talking about America's dependence on foreign oil. Nowhere do Americans feel our economy's reliance on foreign oil more than when filling up at the pump. Everyone who drives knows that the cost of gas has been rising. While some of us have almost become used to gasoline price fluctuations, most of us will never get used to the consequences of high gas prices. Some of the reasons for these fluctuations are straight from the Economics 101 textbook. Demand for oil is rising around the world, and cartels like OPEC, which enforce production controls, aren't doing much to help keep costs down. Geopolitical uncertainty is also doing its part to keep the value of a barrel of oil high. If American drivers are going to see gas prices drop, we need to break our country's dependence on foreign oil. But we also need to break Washington's dependency on taxes and regulation. Lowering the cost of gas is about freeing drivers from regulations that keep prices high and about reducing dependency on foreign oil. When crude oil gets to U.S. shores, it must be processed into gasoline at domestic refineries. Today, the U.S. has the ability to refine about 17 million barrels of oil a day into gasoline. Unfortunately, the average U.S. demand for gasoline is 21 million barrels a day. This gap is often met by importing gasoline that has been refined in other countries, further expanding our reliance on foreign sources of energy. The residents of my district, which is the area surrounding Milwaukee, often experience the hidden fee cost by limited refinery capacity. While the national average for gasoline was recently reported to be $3.07 a gallon, the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel reported yesterday that my constituents are paying $3.28 a gallon. And why so high? Scheduled maintenance, a power failure, and even a fire have reduced capacity at the refineries in Indiana and Minnesota that supply the Milwaukee area. Dr. Felmy of API says the industry is working to increase refinery capacity. And that's very good. However, I also note that it's been 30 years since a new gasoline refinery has been built in the United States. An expensive and cumbersome permitting process has contributed to this trend. Republicans last year tried to streamline this process in a way that will continue to protect the environment. But unfortunately, we met too much opposition along the way. As we hear from the panelists today, higher gas prices are felt in nearly every corner of the economy from farmers to small businesses to school bus operators. Mr. Michael Metternight says in his testimony that gas prices are wrecking havoc on America's small businesses. Mr. Metternight also rightly notes that onerous government regulations hit small businesses very hard. As Congress looks for ways to address both global warming and energy independence issue, I am worried that the cure may be worse than the cough. The most recent report from the UN's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change includes a proposal for a tax of $100 for each ton of carbon dioxide released into the atmosphere. The Washington Post reported last Saturday that that proposal could result in drivers paying up to a dollar more for each gallon of gas they pump. The testimony we'll hear today shows that $4 a gallon gas would be a blow to the economy. 
Fortunately, Mr. Metternight also has many positive ideas on how to address these problems. He says that any government energy problem must focus on new technology, should the use, uh, you should use the power of markets and protect American jobs. And I agree. I will add that energy, any energy or environmental policy must also produce tangible environmental improvements and include international participation from countries like India and China. I am pleased this panel is talking about energy independence. Let's hope that today's discussion helps us find ways to free American drivers from both foreign oil and government regulators. I thank the Chair and yield back the balance of my time. Great. The gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate your setting the context in terms of how we rose to the challenge uh, 30 years ago when we were facing uh, this uh, issue. Uh, the trends that you have that you demonstrated in terms of a failure for us to deal meaningfully with conservation. Um, there is a very real issue in terms of refinery capacity, but it's not a case of uh, tweaking, streamlining regulatory matter. We, I think the record will show that there has been a conscious effort to actually reduce the amount of refining capacity. There has been more consolidation. I look forward to being able to deal with some of the impacts that that has had in terms of the free market. I know that there are other uh, initiatives that are being uh, examined to make sure that there isn't collusion and unfair advantage being taken of uh, by uh, people uh, who are consumers. Uh, I think in any respect it is going to require a, a balanced approach in terms of dealing with supply, in terms of dealing with conservation, making sure that a market that is becoming less and less perfect both nationally and internationally uh, that we examine to see if there are ways we can uh, provide the protections to make sure that the market does, in fact, work. Uh, I appreciate the breadth of opinions that are being offered here. I had a chance to skim some of the testimony. I think it is going to be very useful for us to have as part of the record and look forward to a conversation uh, with people who are dealing with these consequences on an ongoing basis. I know the people that I represent who uh, uh, are now looking at the third highest uh, gasoline prices in the country. Uh, this is not an idle uh, concern, whether they are uh, commuters, whether they are small business people, or that they are people who are just breathing the air and wondering where we are going. Thank you very much. The um, gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, for holding this hearing, and I will uh, waive my opening statement and reserve. The gentleman reserves his time. The gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Walton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, too, would rather reserve my time and uh, use it in questions. Great. Um, the um, gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I am delighted uh, to be here this afternoon to hear what our witnesses have to say. Every time I go home, and I go home just about every weekend here from Washington to visit my district in Los Angeles, the number one question that people tell me at any forum or any meeting is, when is the gas price going to go down, Hilda? I don't want to hear about anything else. I want to know when the gas prices are going to go down. When you have working families suffering right now with other economic constraints on them, uh, you, you hear about the price of gasoline nationally. Well, let me tell you, folks, in California and Los Angeles, for the last two years, it has been above $3. In fact, in district, my district in East Los Angeles, probably one of the poorest areas in the country, uh, we are experiencing levels of $3.69 a gallon, and sometimes even upwards on the west side of town, the higher income, maybe $4.00 and higher. So we're, we're talking about a real crunch on our pocketbook, but we're also talking about the cost of people who want to use public transportation. We, we're seeing proposals right now in my district where the Metropolitan Transportation District would like to increase their fees, almost 80 percent. And the majority of those bus riders tend to be low-income folks that don't have cars, so they use alternative sources of transportation. But again, because of the high cost of gasoline and what have you, uh, they are now going to be experiencing an increase from what is now at $1.25 to up to $2. That is an 87 percent increase for the ridership. And many of my constituents use 
uh, those buses to get around town, to get to work, to see the doctor and what have you. I'm equally concerned also about our schools, and I know uh, one of our wit witnesses will be talking about uh, traveling on school buses. Well, I, I tend to represent one of the largest, second largest school district in the country, LA Unified School District. This was a question that I raised last year during the energy debate. How are we dealing with the high cost of fuel and fuel efficiency and trying to make sure that our students get to school on time and get home on time and that they're safe? And believe me, there wasn't much discussion or concern at the time. Uh, and yes, I, I tend to agree with some of my colleagues here that uh, costs um, that are being transferred onto the consumer uh, are not transparent. And what I'm, what I'm trying to get to is that uh, refineries and what have you, there isn't a shortage of refineries. There's a shortage of political will. So I'm, I look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Great. Gentle, gentlelady's time has expired. The gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Sullivan. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing today on an important issue of rising gas prices. I welcome this debate. As you remember, in 2005, the Republican majority in the House passed the Gasoline for America Security Act. The Gas Act helped bring greater quantities of fuel to the market by expanding domestic refining capacity and limiting the number of gasoline and diesel blend, blends refineries must and blends refineries must produce. By increasing the quantity of fuel that makes it into Americans' neighborhood gas stations, we are able to help keep the price consumers pay per gallon from rising. Additionally, by opening up the outer continental shelf to new energy exploration, the House allowed for oil and natural gas exploration in an area holding 85 percent of America's outer continental shelf energy, much of which was untapped because of a 25-year-old ban on deep-sea energy production. Furthermore, if President Clinton hadn't vetoed ANWR legislation in 1995, the U.S. could be domestically producing one million barrels of oil from that area today. Having both these areas into play would allow the U.S. to have energy security through a more diverse supply. I am submitting for the record a letter from the National School Transportation Association citing their support for past action on gas prices. This includes H.R. Uh, 5254 legislation from the 109th Congress, which would have streamlined the permitting process to allow for new or expanded domestic refineries to be built. I, too, supported this legislation and was original sponsor. This noteworthy legislation would have helped meet Americans' increasing demand for gasoline by increasing domestic refining capacity. It is a shame that this legislation was not able to move past the Senate. Thank you, and I yield back the balance of my time. The uh, gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Cleaver. Mr. Chairman, thank you for holding the hearing. I would reserve my time and use it to ask questions. The gentleman's time will be reserved. The chair recognizes the gentleman from California. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we all know that there are numerous factors uh, if impacting the price of a gallon of gasoline. World conflict, for example, refinery capacity has been mentioned here earlier. Weather changes such as Katrina can all contribute to fluctuating gas prices. However, we are now experiencing prices that are higher in California than the post-Katrina gouge. Uh, we are paying nearly $3.50 a gallon, as my colleague from California mentioned, uh, with reports from some, some stations in the Bay Area just a nickel short of $4 a gallon. This kind of price hike is very bad for commuters and businesses alike. We all know that we are going to experience even higher prices as the summer wears on and vacationers head out. Uh, clearly, if our cars and trucks had better fuel efficiency, lowering the demand for gasoline, the price of gas would be lower. The better the efficiency, the lower the price. Moreover, wasteful consumption of gasoline does contribute to global warming, another very bad outcome. So I am looking forward to hearing the testimony from today's witnesses, and I hope we can highlight just how devastating high prices can be on our small businesses. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman from California's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from Tennessee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for the hearing, and I want to thank and welcome our witnesses. We're looking forward to your testimony today. In many places in the U.S., energy prices for electricity and transportation fuel are increasing significantly. You are hearing that from us today as we are out there with our constituents and responding to what they tell us. It has affected many sectors of our economy and, in 
I district, we hear a lot about this from our small bus businesses and our logistic businesses and their work. I believe that we can make America energy independent and free from all foreign sources of energy, but it is going to take serious actions to increase and diversify our supply of available energy. It's not going to be easy. We did not get here overnight, and we're not going to get out of it overnight. We realize that. The interesting thing is we do have vast resources of oil, gas, and coal in our country that would meet our need for hundreds of years. But there is a group of people that do not want us to tap into these resources. Now, I've had some interesting conversations with some from this group. And when you ask them what they would recommend, sometimes you'll get an answer that sounds like returning to the Stone Age or having a substandard quality of life and shutting down our coal plants because there is a perceived threat of global warming. And most often, it does not include measures that incorporate conservation, innovation, deregulation, exploration, production, or commercialization. All steps, I feel, are necessary to get us to energy independence. What Americans want is reliable and affordable energy, but they do not want to sacrifice their way of life because of somebody's political agenda that is based on what they consider to be a faulty and unproven science. They want options that will allow them a continuance of a good quality of life and an available and affordable energy supply, and they want to continue to benefit from a robust economy. America would rather have us here in Congress encourage the production of more energy right here in this country and not rely on foreign sources of oil that could increase prices with little notice. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for the hearing today. I look forward to the comments from our witness. Thank the gentlelady. Um, and uh, Mr. Inslee, you are the um, last member if you wish to be recognized for an opening statement. I just want to say briefly that there's cause for optimism in this whole issue. Uh, I was walking over to be on C-SPAN's journal this morning and ran across a car that gets 150 miles a gallon, runs 40 miles on electricity when you plug it in, and one day we'll run on ethanol, and we ought to have optimism and use technology to solve this problem, and I'm glad this committee's on the job to do it. I thank the gentleman very much. Um, I'll note uh, before we uh, we'll, we'll hear from the witnesses, but for the members, there's a uh, clock right in the middle of uh, uh, Mr. Teske right there, and uh, and that clock will uh, move from uh, uh, green to yellow with one minute remaining, and then to red if uh, any of you are uh, uh, interested in just keeping track of the time which you have. So now we'll turn to witnesses, and I would like to now recognize our first witness, Mr. Terry Thomas. President and CEO of the Community Bus Service Incorporated in Youngstown, Ohio. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much, Chairman Markey, members of the committee. My name is Terry Thomas. I'm President and CEO of Community Bus Services. My company provides school bus service to 22 school districts and 7,000 students in Northern Ohio. I'm past president of the National School Transportation Association, which represents private school bus contractors that operate one third of the nation's 475,000 school buses. I also serve on the governing committee of the American School Bus Council, which is a coalition of public and private school bus operators, manufacturers, suppliers, and state policy makers. We represent the entire school bus industry. And my remarks today are consistent with the entire school bus industry. I appreciate the opportunity to share with you my concerns about the effect of energy dependence, rising fuel costs on my family, and I'm the father of five children, three of which ride the school bus every day, my business, the school districts I serve, and the entire school bus industry. According to the latest statistics from the U.S. Department of Education, 56 percent of public school students in the United States depend on school bus to access their education. 25 million public school children every day on a fleet of vehicles that's two and a half times the size of all other forms of mass transportation. That's transit buses, inner city buses, commercial airlines, and rail combined. 
School buses are far safer statistically than any other mode of travel with an average of 20 fatalities a year compared to 800 fatalities a year for students traveling to school by any other means. Teenagers are 44 times safer if they ride the bus rather than riding with their friends. But when faced with the need to cut service, school districts are most likely to discontinue high school transportation, thereby encouraging or even forcing teenagers to high risk driving. School buses play an important role in mitigating traffic congestion, replacing an average of 50 personal automobiles for every school bus on the road. In addition, one school bus uses significantly less fuel than 50 cars and SUVs. Federal government provides no funding source for routine home to school transportation or school activity transportation. Increasingly, a larger burden falls on the local school districts to support school transportation, and though it represents just 4% of the total school budget, it's the first target hit when districts need to reduce expenditures. From September 2004 to September 2005, the price of diesel fuel increased an average of 58% a dollar a gallon. Though prices slipped back somewhat in 2006, they're on the rise again and in many areas have reached or exceeded the 2005 highs. Other transportation modes are better able to either absorb the cost or pass them on to the marketplace. The school bus operators literally have nowhere to go. School districts have had to find other ways to respond, most of which now involve reduction of school bus service. For example, Troy, Michigan eliminated sports and activity trips. Massachusetts districts are charging parents for school bus service. Ohio eliminated, if you can believe this, 80,000 students from school transportation over the last two years. Tennessee and Georgia closed schools for two days last year, and Kentucky went to four-day weeks for some schools just as a result of the cost of the fuel for the school buses. Congestion, pollution, excessive fuel consumption, inconvenience to parents and employers, inconsistent attendance, and interruptions in the educational progress, all of these res result from reductions in school bus service. But the number one reason to ensure that school buses keep running is student safety. We know Congress is tackling this issue on many fronts, and our industry has supported efforts to increase supply through more refinery capacity and reasonable exploration of oil and to protect consumers against price gouging. Additional steps that might help with school, school with fuel costs and congestion include the use of federal highway congestion mitigation funding for the purchase of new school buses and for a national public education campaign to encourage the greater use of school buses to cut down on the use of personal vehicles. Federal assistance to school districts to offset the ever-increasing cost of fuel, regardless of whether the districts operate it themselves or if they contract out for the service. An investment tax credit or other incentives for bus manufacturers to encourage the production of energy efficient and alternative power vehicles. An energy tax credit for school bus companies to encourage purchase of a cleaner, more energy efficient fleet and funding to assist federal mandates to meet safety, environmental, and security standards. As fuel costs go up due to the increased cost of energy, everyone fe feels the burden, including parents who pay for gas to drive their school children. Already, schools are seeing a difference. 60% of the districts reported an increase of ridership due to fuel prices. I want to thank the committee for this opportunity to provide some insight into our industry and share our concerns. Thank you, Mr. Thomas, very much. Our second witness, Mr. Michael Miternight, uh, is the owner of Factory Service Agency Incorporated, a commercial air conditioning construction and service company in Metairie, Louisiana. He's been nominated as a finalist for the 2007 Small Business Advocate of the Year. After Hurricane Katrina, he helped many New Orleans area businesses recover and resume operations. Welcome, Mr. Miternight. Thank you, Chairman Markey and Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the committee. My name is Mike Mitternight. Uh, I'm the owner of Factory Service Agency, a family-owned small business established in 1975, located in the New Orleans suburb of Metairie, Louisiana. My company specializes in commercial air conditioning service and installation throughout southeast Louisiana. I'm also a member of the National Small Business Association, which the Chairman just mentioned. I'd like to thank you for inviting me to testify today about the impact of rising gasoline prices on small businesses, particularly mine. I am very grateful that you are cognizant of the negative effect increasing gasoline prices are having on small business across the country and that you are seeking to address it. 
Whatever the cause, the volatile increasing price of gasoline is wreaking havoc on America's small businesses. In the day-to-day -day operation of my small business, I have as many as six service trucks and three management vehicles on the street at any one point in time. In order to carry the load of tools and service equipment necessary to provide the service for the equipment upon which we work, most of my service trucks are three-quarter ton pickup trucks with a service body on the back. Obviously, these trucks fall into the category of non-fuel efficient vehicles. Unfortunately, there is no affordable alternative to this choice. Currently, the cost of gasoline in the metropolitan New Orleans area varies from $2.88 per gallon to $2.93 per gallon from a low of $1.98 late last year. This sudden and unpredictable 50 percent increase hits directly at the bottom line of my business and countless others. In my industry, one major problem is that many of my service and maintenance contracts are fixed cost contracts with billable rates established well in advance, sometimes for a period of a year, with no opportunity to recoup increased expenses. Although I routinely try to include an estimated escalation percentage in my pricing, the actual cost of gasoline is impossible to project. If I project too large an increase, I lose the contract. If I project too small, I lose money. The direct impact on cash flow, the lifeblood of any business, is seen when you compare our weekly operating costs for fuel from $325 in December of 2006 to my current expense of $510 a week. This represents an increase of 60 percent in only five months. A fellow contractor in my area provided me with cost figures on his company, showing an increase of 113 percent in fuel costs between 2002 and 2006. How in the world is a small business owner like, my, like me supposed to cope with this sort of a volatile and devastating price increase? How can I expect to formulate a viable business model with these sorts of wild price fluctuations? How can I grow my business? How can I add additional employees? As summer months approach, fuel costs continue to rise almost exponentially with the temperature. Unfortunately for my business, the summer price surge occurs during a period of increased fuel consumption as a result of expanded service activity. I dare say that these numbers are typical for most businesses, regardless of their geographic location. In fact, 75 percent of respondents to an NSBA survey last year reported their businesses had either been significantly or moderately affected by rising prices. In order to maintain any level of profit in my operation, I have no alternative but to pass the cost of rising gasoline prices on to my customers. Sometimes I could arbitrarily increase, uh, just put a fuel surcharge on, but I can't do that on, on fixed cost contracts and, and long-term customers, and I can't arbitrarily raise hourly rates. One unique problem that I face in the New Orleans area, the fact that many areas are still recovering, is that the availability of service stations is a factor. No longer are there sources of fuel in every other corner. It's imperative that my service technicians be properly routed to ensure that they have adequate gas supply for their day's routes as they make their rounds. The immediate problem of removing floodwaters from my property, working to help family and employees return and recover, reestablishing customer contact, and establishing necessary financing when my accounts receivable became accounts inconceivable following the storm, all seem to have been a foreteller of today's problem of upward spiraling fuel costs. Despite such persistence obstacles, the situation in New Orleans has improved. At least I no longer have to fill five-gallon gas cans at a remote location and fuel my trucks by hand. Now my main concern seems to be what will the price be at the pump when my trucks roll out in the morning. One thing to deal with such uncertainty and volatility in the midst of what is arguably the worst natural disaster in the nation's history is another to have to deal with day-to-day -day basis a year and a half after the event occurred. In New Orleans area, we're working to solve these problems. The rising costs of gas is just a, a, a devastating problem that we're fighting, but it's something we're trying to deal with. Uh, the NSBA has several issues that, uh, that they are supporting and ideas that they are behind. I mentioned in my written testimony, increasing and diversifying the domestic and energy pop, uh, production, improving the efficiency standards, which would help everyone, studying utilization of hybrid vehicles, especially those that run on alternative fuels, but they need to be something that are capable of carrying service loads on, on major service trucks, and most hybrid vehicles won't accomplish that. Thank you for your time, sir. Welcome questions. Thank you, Mr. Metanik. Speaking of alternative fuels, Mr. Don Teske is a farmer from northeastern Kansas. Um, he is now in his seventh year as the Kansas Farmer Union President. He serves on the boards of, many, of numerous other agricultural associations. Uh, he's worked at Kansas State University as a farm analyst. We welcome you, Mr. Teske. Whenever you feel comfortable, please begin. Thank you. <clears throat> 
Thank you, Congressman Markey, uh, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the committee. I consider this a really unique opportunity for a pretty darn nervous redneck farmer from Kansas to, to be addressing this group. So if I, <laughs> if I get to stutter around, have patience with me. Uh, the energy consumption in agriculture is a very significant issue, and I really welcome the opportunity to have it. And, and representing and speaking on behalf of Kansas Farmers Union and National Farmers Union, we really want to to compliment this committee on a proactive approach that they're having to addressing this very serious issue. Uh, personally, we operate a fifth generation farm in northeast Kansas, as the congressman said. Uh, we're on the eastern edge of the Flint Hills in Pottawatomie County, Kansas. Uh, the operation is about 2,000 acres. Uh, about two thirds of that is native blue stem grass. Uh, another 500 acres of it is certified organic. On that, we raise commodities that we sell into the organic livestock industry, mostly alfalfa hay, red clover hay, uh, corn, milo, wheat, soybeans, that type of thing. Uh, in the past, my wife and I operated a dairy farm there for many years. Uh, my wife, Kathy, was really glad to see the cows go. Uh, the agriculture has really been stagnant for quite a few years now. I farm for over 30 years. And, and a lot of the times it ends up the year in the red, and if it's in the black, it's usually about the difference in the government subsidy payments that make the difference. Both my wife and I have had to seek off-farm employment to sustain a family. To me, there's something wrong when you have a farm operation that size and both spouses are working off the farm to feed the family so they can produce their share of the, the country's food supply virtually for free. Now on top of that, we get into a situation like this where we have uh, been blindsided by super high energy costs and it's a, it's a double whammy. Uh, a former congressman from Massachusetts, uh, John Kennedy, once said that the farmer is the only entity out there that, that buys everything retail and sells everything wholesale. And there's a lot of truth in that. You know, everything that we put into the farm we buy in the marketplace and we have virtually no control over what we get from it. And, and the new energy cost expenditures that we're getting on, we can't automatically pass on, so the buck stops here and it's with us and it's already been a bad situation. And we're trying to deal with this at a time when oil companies are recording record profits. A little hard to digest. To put a little perspective into the farm situation, I, I got some information from Kansas State University farm management data. In 2000, it took about 115 bucks to put in an acre of non-irrigated crops in Kansas. Of that, 26% was energy related. In 2005, it took 140 bucks and about 35% is energy related. That's, enough, that's over 20 bucks an acre that I gotta figure out how to come up with. To put it on a personal note, uh, I have some letters I'd like to include as, as support from a real bank and, and from a trucker. I had a trucker that uh, took a load of hay to Texas for me a couple weeks ago. That load of alfalfa hay was 20 tons. It's going to bring me about $3,500 check when it's all done. The increased expenses on the recent escalation in fuel prices compared to what we have did before is going to add 600 bucks of trucking expense to that load. Somewhere between the three entities, the trucker, the dairyman, and myself, we got to figure out how to absorb that 600 bucks to keep going the way we've been going. And, and that's, that doesn't work very well. Now, on the positive side of things, it looks to me like society is finally starting to address the issue of our environment. And I think that's wonderful. Uh, global warming, to me, is very real. And I think it's the scariest thing that I'm leaving for my children. Economies can be fixed, governments can be fixed. You mess up our world, it kind of got a problem. Uh, I think that we as a nation need to take uh, responsibility, and I have four quick steps that I wanted to put in. Uh, uh, number one, foremost, is energy conservation. We're a gluttony nation and we need to do something about it. Number two, we need a, a nationwide renewable portfolio standard. Uh, especially addressing uh, community wind would be my passion. Number three, I think we need to address the food issues in our transportation system and food delivery. We need to go back to more local food production and, and supply 
and distribution. We're shipping our food all over the country. And number four, in the worst case scenarios, we may have to look at uh, rationing because we may have to separate the entertainment from the, from the necessities. And uh, I do want to thank you and would ask that that be included. Thank you. Um, I thank you, Mr. Teske. And uh, without objection, it will be included in the record. We thank you for quoting President Kennedy on farm policy. That's uh, very helpful to me. Uh, actually, we were just the reverse in the Markey family. My father was a milkman, so we actually were back at the retail end again, going door to door with it, uh, having the company purchase it wholesale. Uh, we'll now move on to our next uh, witness. Uh, our next uh, witness is, uh, excuse me, let me just find this here. Our next witness is uh, uh, Sylvia Estes. She's a Native American Indian. She owns two businesses in Virginia Beach, Virginia. The Pipeline and Industrial Group performs new construction, uh, demolition, design build, emergency response, uh, mostly for the federal government. We welcome you. Ms. Estes, whenever you're ready, please begin. I think, can you push your... Um, I'm more on. nervous than he is. Well, he did a great job. He and did I'm a sure fabulous you job. Um, I'm a farmer as well. I have a horse farm and a construction company, both of which, anyone here, we all know that with fuel costs going up, we have firm fixed price contracts. We do not get economic adjustments, and we eat it off the bottom line. So as your costs keep going up or our costs keep going up, our profit margins keep going down. Um, I'll sit here and try and go back to, to my speech, which I'm not very good at. Founded in January 2000, Pipeline Industrial Group started with four employees and two trucks. Our primary work was petroleum. Um, the field of petroleum had lacked and we went into construction. The government grew us in construction. Um, as of today, we support 120 people. That includes wives and children. We're a team. We work together as a team. Together we overcome problems every single day. We do whatever the government asks of us, um, whether it's the new construction or hurricane cleanup. Um, I've talked about rising gas prices and how they're affecting the small business like mine and the families and the community that they support. We cannot build in contingency costs into our proposals with the government. Um, any additional cost at all um, just comes off our bottom line profits. The rise in fuel costs affect nearly every aspect of my business in one way or another. Many direct costs um, cost me more to run my business. Um, Cost of materials, copper, steel, they've escalated in price. Um, cost in labor, and my employees expect more money. In order for them to even get to work, I have to pay them more money, and in order to keep them, I have to get employees that don't have as much experience so that I can afford them, and then I have to train them, and I have to start all over again. Every time our economy shifts, the small business shifts. We're good people. We work hard. We want to do good for you. We believe that there's technology available to you that we would all hope that you would look at, technology that's a little different than the normal. I spent four days writing your speech that I can't even remember. I looked at every single thing on the Internet I could possibly read, and my poor brain got fried. I did find one thing that I found was extremely interesting, and it was called Guy Tran runs off the solar energy. It's not um, paid for by the government. It's private industry. Whether it'll work or not, I can't answer that. I don't have your answers, but I do know that there is technology here in the United States that does have your answers. And instead of us relying on someone else to give our country what we need to exist, why can't we rely on ourselves? We do it every day as a team, Hurricane Katrina. We all pitched in together. That's what Americans made of. It's not made of politics. And I'll give you a, a small joke that I've recently been told. Politics are the worst kind of ticks to have. And as a country girl, I agree with that. Um, I'm sorry. We're out here earning a living. We want to make the best for our employees. We treat them with respect. We give them the respect that they're out there working for us. 
And as long as we keep that respect in life, we all keep moving up. When we take that respect away, and when you start raising the cost, consider the fact that these people aren't eating lunch. You may actually have enough money in your bank account to afford to go out to lunch, but most employees don't. They skip lunch, they skip breakfast, and they eat dinner. I have a nursery in my office so I can keep my employees from leaving. Um, we have a lot of babies being born. It's one way that I can give back instead of giving raises. Every employer should be responsible for their employees. You shouldn't go to sleep at night if you don't think your business is going to make it. You should figure out how to make it. I would like to ask you guys to look at how to make it. Because I can tell you in four days between running a business, two businesses, and two teenagers, there's not much left of me. But I do know that there are answers. I know they're here. I know the internet is a great source for them. I have read more articles. One says it's pro, one says it's against. I mean, what's real? Is, does anyone truly know what is truly real? And I agree with him. Global warming is real. We are experiencing more storms. In fact, I've been invited by the government to go next week or the week after to a world global emergency summit because we are facing problems. We need to pay attention to what is going to be 20 years from now, 40 years from now, not just today. We have children and hopefully someday grandchildren. And I thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Estes, very much. And I heard what you said at the beginning of your statement, and I know you won't take this as a compliment, but you would become, you would be an excellent politician, okay? So you should, <laughs> <laughs> you really, you have the makings of one. You're very good. Uh, and next, um, we have John Felmy. Uh, Dr. Felmy is the chief economist of the American Petroleum Institute. He is responsible for overseeing economic, statistical, and policy analysis uh, of the American Petroleum Institute. He has over 25 years' experience in energy, economic, and environmental analysis. He received bachelor's and master's in economics from Pennsylvania State University and a Ph.D. in economics from the University of Maryland. Welcome, Dr. Felmy. Whenever you are ready, please begin. Chairman Markey, Ranking Member Sensenbrenner, members of the committee, I am John Felmy, Chief Economist of API, the National Trade Association of the U.S. oil and natural gas industry. API represents nearly 400 companies involved in all aspects of oil and natural gas industry, including exploration and production, refining, marketing, transportation, as well as service companies that support our industry. U.S. oil and gas companies understand the frustration that consumers are expressing about gasoline prices. We recognize that these higher prices adversely impact individuals, households, businesses, and potentially the economy. Our member companies are doing everything they can to meet the fuel needs of U.S. consumers. As of today, crude oil inventories have been building and are 8.9 percent above the five-year average of this time. Year-to-date gasoline production is 8.85 million barrels per day, the highest ever. Thanks to the industry's major investments in state-of-the-art refining technologies, our companies are able to squeeze more gasoline and diesel fuel from a barrel of crude oil compared to past years. Looking ahead, we expect to bring the equivalent of an additional eight new refineries into operation by 2011. Despite the industry's all-out efforts, we are still faced with a set of challenges that in combination have driven up gasoline prices. Most importantly, crude oil prices have fluctuated significantly, driven by lingering geopolitical tensions, OPEC's continuing production controls, and worldwide demand growth. More than half the price of gasoline is attributable to crude oil. Oil companies do not set the price of crude. It is bought and sold in international markets, and the price paid for a barrel of crude reflects the market conditions of that day. A second major factor is that gasoline demand in the U.S. reached a record high in the first quarter of this year. The Department of Energy forecasts that demand will increase further in the summer driving season, which begins this month. Moreover, nearly half of U.S. gasoline is blended with ethanol, so as demand has gone up, ethanol prices and the cost of ethanol blended gasoline has risen as well. In addition, the annual switchover to summer blend gasoline required by EPA has occurred, and this warm weather gasoline is more expensive to produce. The switchover requires a large supply drawdown to meet regulations. And less gasoline is available to import because of spring refinery maintenance in Europe, an 18-day French port workers' strike in March led, by some, led some European refiners to reduce production. 
U.S. gasoline production this year is at all-time record highs despite regularly scheduled refinery maintenance and several unexpected problems, problems that have interrupted some refining operations. The maintenance is a normal procedure, though delayed in some cases by damage suffered from the catastrophic hurricanes in 2005. While maintenance curtails refining operations temporarily, it helps to ensure the long-term viability of the refinery and protects the health and safety of our workers. Some are again accusing the industry of illegal activity. Our industry has been repeatedly investigated over the many decades by the Federal Trade Commission and State Attorneys General. Of more than 30 investigations that we are aware of, all have resulted in exoneration. I would also note that the introduction of price gouging legislation in, a, in the note the introduction of price gouging legislation in Congress. I would caution that this legislation could have many unintended consequences that would not benefit consumers. Rising gasoline prices are a burden on U.S. consumers, but they cannot be viewed in isolation from the U.S. energy situation. The solution to the energy challenges we face is to increase and diversify sources of supply, including alternatives, reduce demand, and expand infrastructure. We have plenty, plentiful domestic oil and gas resources remaining to be discovered in the U.S. Only government policies stand in the way of increasing access to these resources, facilitating refining capacity and pipeline expansions, and increasing energy security. Air American can meet its energy challenges just as it has met great challenges in the past. But meaningful changes in energy policy will be required. API stands ready to work with your committee and others in the Congress and the administration to help bring about these changes that are so important for America's energy future. With that, I'll thank the, the committee, and I will be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Dr. Felmy, very much. That completes the time for opening statements by the witnesses. The chair will now turn and recognize himself for five minutes. Um, Dr. Felmy, um, yesterday in the Senate Commerce Committee, uh, legislation dealing with fuel economy of, of uh, cars and light trucks was passed. Senator Cantwell added a amendment which um, dealt with the oil, uh, the issue of oil price gouging. Um, can I ask you some questions about that? Do you agree that President Bush should have the authority to declare a temporary national emergency if there was a threatened or existing disruption of oil and petroleum supplies due to events such as a hurricane or a terrorist attack? I believe that uh, in the area of price gouging you have a number of um, possibilities that uh, could be considered. I haven't seen the exact legislation to know the exact wording on how that could be declared and what would else go with it. But we do have cases where governors have the ability to be able to declare emergencies for some uh, situations such as that. So it would be something that we would have to look at carefully. Well, you were quoted in uh, yesterday's uh, at newspaper as saying that Senator Cantwell's legislation was unfortunate political rhetoric with no basis in fact. So uh, I think that uh, today's uh, answer is somewhat different, in fact, radically different from what you said yesterday. Let me ask another question. Do you agree that in the event that there was a national emergency, national energy emergency, that it, would, that it should be illegal to charge unconscionably uh, excessive prices for gasoline? As an economist, Mr. Chairman, I do not know what unconscionable means. Uh, we, what we have seen in the past in terms of changes have been largely as a result of market forces at all levels of the supply chain. I simply do not know what unconscionable means in terms of a definition that can be uh, usefully employed that would not cause uh, potential problems in the marketplace that could again have unintended consequences. I think the other witnesses know what unconscionable would mean in terms of high energy prices. I see uh, all four heads nodding. Uh, do you agree, uh, Dr. Felmy, uh, that especially at a time when we might be in a national energy emergency, that there should be an explicit statutory ban on manipulative practices in wholesale petroleum markets? I am not an attorney, Mr. Chairman, so I can't comment beyond uh, just I believe the understanding of the law is that you already have many uh, provisions in place to deal with manipulation under the regulatory authority of the Commodities Future Trading Commission and the Federal Trade Commission. 
Do you agree that it should be illegal to knowingly submit false information about wholesale petroleum prices to the Federal Trade Commission? I, again, Mr. Chairman, I am not an attorney, but my understanding is that you already have those provisions in place. You have had prosecutions to that effect for false submitting of data uh, to various entities. Let me ask the other witnesses uh, quickly if uh, each of you could uh, tell us what the pr what it would mean to each of you briefly if the price of gasoline moved over $4 a gallon, very briefly. Mr. Thomas. Markey, I'm sorry. The, the number of students riding school buses would dramatically increase, but the problem would be that we wouldn't be able to afford to deliver that bus service because that money would be taken out of the education. Mr. Mennonite. It would require me to definitely raise prices to my customers and try to renegotiate contracts. I would have to find some way to, to, to pass that cost on in order to maintain any profitability. Mr. Teske. Um, at this point in agriculture, we don't have the ability to pass it on. So we are talking about a disaster without the agriculture industry. And you are talking about additional subsidies or you are talking about some major change within the marketing system. Ms. Estes. I work for the Federal Government and I know they don't have any money, so um, I can't pass it on either. So I would say it would be closing my doors down. Well, I will say this. Uh, it is the goal of the Speaker to pass legislation that will uh, deal with this issue of uh, price gouging, uh, and we intend on doing that this year um, uh, very, very soon. Uh, in uh, the first three months of this year, ExxonMobil, Chevron, ConocoPhillips, Shell and BP collectively reported $29.4 billion in profits. Um, this Congress in January in one week, uh, the first week, passed legislation to reclaim $14 billion uh, in excess of royalties uh, that uh, the oil companies had received and created a fund for renewable energy and for energy conservation. The White House opposes that. Uh, that is uh, half of the money uh, that these oil companies made in three months. Uh, and we are trying to move the country in a different direction. But this administration continues to fight us. The, the time of the chair has expired. We will turn to recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Sensenbrenner. Oh, um, I thank the gentleman for giving me this time. We live in a market economy, and one of the laws that Congress can't repeal is the law of supply and demand. Um, so if we want the price of anything, including petroleum, to go down, uh, we have to either increase the supply or reduce the demand or a combination of the two. Um, I think probably the most telling immediate statistic that we have is that our refining capacity is about 17 million barrels a day and the demand for gasoline is about 21 million barrels a day. Uh, can I ask all five witnesses if they think that we would get immediate price relief if we went on a crash program to increase our refining capacity so that we are able to have more product on the market, starting with you, Dr. Felmy? Mr. Sensenbrenner, I would agree that increasing capacity would allow more refining of uh, petroleum products for the consumers. As an economist, whenever you increase okay, supply. Okay, I, I want some brief answers. I got five minutes. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Estes? Absolutely. Pesky? I'm not convinced and that itself would do it. Okay, Mr. Mitternight? I think in the long run it would. I don't think it would be immediate because the cost of the fabrication or the construction of the new refineries would be there. But I think in the long run it would definitely bring the cost down. Mr. Thomas. Okay. Now, another way to reduce demand is to raise the price. Uh, in my opening statement, I talked about the carbon tax that the UN is talking about uh, uh, imposing of approximately $100 a ton, which translates to about a dollar a gallon uh, uh, of gasoline, according to last Saturday's Washington Post. Uh, what do you think would happen to your businesses if we pass this carbon tax, starting with you, Mr. Thomas? Well, as long as the school buses remained exempt from the Federal taxes as they okay, are now. That's, okay, that's a good thought. Uh, how about you, Mr. Mitternight? 
uh, in, any increase in taxation, if there's any way to reduce taxes, and being from Louisiana, we have a, a, above and beyond our fair share of taxes on everything that we do. So uh, we, we couldn't Just come stand to Wisconsin interest. if you want to see how, how bad taxes are. <laughs> Mr. Teske, how about the dollar uh, a gallon increase because of the carbon tax that uh, is being talked about? You know, I wouldn't like that for the same reasons we said all along, but at the same time, if all the polluters had that same carbon tax on it, mm -hmm. I think we can make dramatic differences. Those coal plants do a heck of a lot more than my farm equipment does. Okay, Ms. Estes. Bottom line, um, it would hurt my employees more than it would hurt me. because Financially, at this point, I can't keep giving them rates. Mm -hmm. But they're gonna go without food. Dr. So Felmy. Carbon tax could have uh, severe negative impacts on the economy. Uh, API does not have a specific position on many of these global uh, policies that are being discussed, but we would certainly uh, welcome the opportunity to talk about all of them. Okay. Now, some people around here, including my dear friend, the chair, uh, seem to think that uh, the magic wand is increasing cafe standards. And I saw the chart that he had uh, raised behind him during his opening statement. Uh, I ask you, because my time is running out, Dr. Felmy, uh, when the CAFE standards kicked in, we had a period of double-digit interest rates, stagflation, and then followed by a recession. Uh, how much of the reduced imports do you think were caused by economic factors other than the increase in the CAFE standards? I haven't done, an, Mr. Chair, Mr. Ranking Member, I haven't done an analytical study, but there's no question there were three broad factors that caused the reduction in demand. CAFE standards could have had a, an impact. We also had high prices. We had $3.22 per gallon in 1981 in today's dollars for gasoline. And finally, economic activity slowed, slowed down in recession. All had significant impacts. Okay. So it would be your considered judgment that it was not exclusively the raising of the CAFE standards that uh, uh, caused the reduction in our percentage of oil that we imported from overseas? That would be my judgment, sir. Uh, I thank the chair, and I yield back the balance of my time. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon, Mr. Blumenauer. Thank you. And I, I, Mr. Chairman, would like to thank you and the staff for assembling, uh, I think, a very useful panel. I thought the range of experience that was given um, in real life, putting a face on this, was extraordinarily helpful. And I, I appreciate uh, what we have heard. Um, I'm particularly um, I want to just, if I could, Mr. Teske, you had um, uh, given a hint there um, about, uh, you talked about the carbon tax or some sort of carbon system. I mean, I think most people agree the world is moving in this direction. We've got 10 northwest states or northeastern states that are doing it. Uh, most of the business community understands that there will be some carbon constraint. Um, you hinted at something. Um, would it make a difference to you or any of the panel members if there was some sort of uh, carbon constraint in terms of what happened to it? This, if it was used to be able to help give you the type of energy technology that you want, if it was used to defray the high costs that some particularly lower income people uh, were contending with, if it was used to offset the costs, for example, in some cases of more energy efficient equipment uh, or technology. Does that make a difference to you in terms of um, how this money is used? Are there ways that it could be used that would make a difference to how you do business? It is kind of an interesting concept. I, I, uh, as I kind of hinted out there, I. I don't like new taxes, but we have to take environmental responsibility. My my belief is that global warming is true, and so where do we where do we take those steps? And so, I was having this discussion with a close friend that I have a lot of respect in recently, and we were talking about the current marketing structure and 
could we address increased fuel cost alone to reduce demand? And both of us didn't think that marketplace would allow that flow through to happen so the general economies could flow. And so the, about the only way we're going to have to do it is with some type of federal government interaction. And whether that's a carbon tax or something else, I, I don't know what the proper st structure for that is. But I don't think the, quote, free marketplace that we have now is, is going to absorb that and pass that through the system. And so we'd have devastated businesses and economies all around the country with trying to do it with just increased gas prices in alone. If, 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 the, if, the pollution, if the polluters that were building this carbon problem were taxed equally across the board, I, I would have a hard time arguing with that. Let me, just, let me just say, I don't want to catch any of you unawares, but I want to plant the seed and invite you to think about ways that it might make a difference to you. And I, I would like to follow up, Mr. Teske, with one thing you talked about in terms of the, in terms of the farm uh, legislation, because one of the things that this committee is looking at, we're not, we're not originating legislation per se, but we're looking at big concepts. We do have a farm bill that's coming along uh, that has lots of opportunities to deal with rural redevelopment, to deal with, uh, there will be an energy title in it, to deal with things uh, that, uh, from wind to uh, solar to biomass, um, where federal farm policy might be able to reduce the carbon footprint of American agriculture and help farmers do that. And I wondered if you had any thoughts about uh, what um, the farm bill might do to help people in your situation with the energy uh, question. Oops. I realized I have less than a minute, and that's not fair either. I'll follow up with you personally on that. Uh, I want to, uh, I just wanted to um, make one point. We've talked about refining capacity, Mr. Chairman. Um, it, just, it just seems to me um, that there is a pretty clear record that there were uh, opportunities um, for, there's only been one refinery proposal, to my knowledge, in the last 30 years, one in Yuma, uh, uh, since the early 1990s. It's received all its environmental permits, but couldn't get financing because nobody wanted to invest in it. And the oil companies had lots of money. It wasn't that they didn't have money to invest. It seems to me that there were bets made that they could make money without increasing refining capacity. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The okay, gentleman's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Shattuck, for seven minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this hearing. Um, I, I don't really want to get into the issue in great depth, but I want to begin by asking unanimous consent to put into the record a letter from Arizona C Clean Fuels Yuma, uh, which goes into the issue raised by the gentleman from Oregon just a moment ago. Arizona Clean Fuels Yuma, I believe, is very close to having its financing. Uh, the letter is included, uh, includes with it a uh, lengthy analysis of the delays in the construction project. The gentleman is correct. I think that is the only effort to get a new refinery online. Uh, they detail at length the regulatory impediments to that, uh, and uh, I would uh, put that in the record if I might. Without, without objection, it will be included in the record. Um, I want to thank the panel for their testimony. I think it's very interesting. Uh, uh, it actually reminds me of a number of conversations with my wife uh, over what happens this time of year, uh, and I'll go into that in just a moment. Uh, I, want to, I do want to follow up on a, uh, a line of questioning that Mr. Sensenbrenner had. Um, he asked you about a carbon tax, uh, and were a carbon tax to add a dollar to the cost of fuel, um, what that would do in terms of having an impact on, on you. Another idea that is floating out there and has been proposed uh, by a lot of thoughtful people and has been implemented in part in Europe is the idea of uh, a cap and trade program. That is, a, we would set a cap on carbon emissions and then you would buy and sell trading permits. Uh, Europe has implemented such a cap and trade system, not, by the way, for mobile sources, but for fixed sources of carbon. Uh, and it has caused an increase in the cost of energy of between 16 and 25 percent. Let's assume it's half of that, an increase of 8 percent or 10 percent. Um, 
each of you expressed concern about a carbon tax in terms of driving up the cost of fuel. Uh, I assume you would feel your thoughts about uh, an increase in cost would be the same if it were as a result of the imposition of a cap and trade system. Uh, Mr. Thomas, would you? Yes, the result would be the same. Yes, I, any increase in taxation does the same thing. Mr. Teske? I believe I have addressed that issue. I, I Fair enough. I am not sure if the increase in tax of a dollar is going to be enough to make the difference that we need to make. Mr. Felmy? If, if properly imp or if implemented in the same technique as using a carbon tax, then you would likely have the same impacts. Uh, the issue with cap and trade is allowances and a whole host of much more complicating factors that can uh, distort the system significantly. Yeah, one of my concerns is that in Europe it appears to have added cost without having achieved the environmental goal. Um, but let me, and that would be one of my concerns. Let me ask another concern because I'm curious about this. I personally favor uh, if you're going to impose a cost to, for example, reduce carbon emissions. I would rather have it be a visible cost. I have a little bit of concern that if it were in a cap and trade uh, as opposed to a carbon tax, it would be buried and people wouldn't be able to see it. I, I hope you all understand what I'm saying. Would you prefer, if there's going to be a cost to reduce carbon in our atmosphere, would you rather it be clearly set out and visible so we know what that cost is, or does that not matter? And if it were buried in a cap and trade system, that would be just as well with you. Mr. Felmy? API only has a position that we would like all of the different options to be discussed. These are very complicated uh, systems that can put in place. Ms. Estes? It is a question whether you would rather see it or not I'd or have it buried. I would rather see it. I think the American people right now, one of the big things I saw is we don't have any trust. Right. That, so I would rather see it. I believe they need to see Fair it. Fair enough. Mr. Teske? I would like to see it. Ms. Knitternight? I agree. I would want to know where it is going. Mr. Thomas? Uh, Mr. Thomas, um, I had the impression uh, that most school buses run on diesel, but maybe I am wrong about that. You are correct. Okay. And so your fleet would be a diesel fleet, and when we are talking generally gasoline prices, you are talking about diesel prices having gone up the same? Is that what you are saying? Actually more. Yeah, diesel prices have gone up more? Yes, they have. Um, have, you, have you taken a look at natural gas as a fuel for your fleet? And yes, is that actually the industry has. And, and, and the, net, the net effect is that we believe that clean diesel has the, the best effect overall on both the supply for the fleet and not only the, the global impact, the emissions impact, but the uh, availability to school districts. There are developments in clean diesel which dramatic recent developments making it even cleaner than natural gas. Is it, that correct? It, it actually uh, almost reduces all the emissions that we consider toxic so you on clean diesel. That, that leads me to a kind of a broad question. Would you all agree that we need to keep a broad diversity of, in our fuels, that is, gasoline, diesel, uh, biodiesel, uh, liquid to gas, coal liquid to gas? Is a broad diversity something you think will help hold down cost? Well, just I, go down I think it would. Better night? I would think it would, as, again, as long as it is adaptable to a, a, a small business's fleet of vehicles that you can adapt easily. Mr. Teske? In the short term, yes. In the long term, I think we will have something come out, a clear winter that is a lot better than petroleum, hopefully hydrogen or something well, uh, like yeah, that. I am not limiting this to petroleum by any means. Ms. Estes? Yes, I definitely agree that you need to look at the wider spectrum. There are other alternatives out there. You have mentioned Europe. Europe is using a turbine nuclear power system. I need, I need to, I appreciate that. We will look into it. Dr. Felmy? We're going forward, we will need all sources of energy to increase. We will need energy efficient. We will need more infrastructure. Um, my time has just about expired. Uh, you said, Mr. Dr. Felmy, that there is a large supply drawdown required by regulations. My wife says, why do the gas prices go up at this time of year every year? Uh, and she says, why are some of, you said summer fuels more expensive. Is the government causing by either regulation or by prescription of a formula gasoline causing prices to go up at this particular time of year? And I'll, with that, I yield. The regulations uh, require summer blend gasoline starting May 1st, unless you are in California, and then it is March 1st, April 1st, May 1st. So it is a much more complicated system. You need cleaner burning gasoline that has uh, uh, less evaporative properties, and that is more expensive to produce. And 
I'm done. The gentleman's time has expired. The chair recognizes the gentlelady from California, Ms. Solis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I'd like to uh, make a comment uh, directed to Mr. Felmy. While I appreciate your testimony on the oil and natural gas industry, claiming that they understand the frustrations of our consumers, um, I, I tend to question um, that appreciation given your testimony and what I've read in your statement. First, you go to great lengths to defend the industry profits and criticize efforts to protect consumer gouging. And you left out several details, some of which I'd like to mention. In April of 2004, Bloomberg News Service reported that ExxonMobil refining profit rose 39 percent. We heard earlier from our chairman uh, regarding that. They actually made a profit of $1 billion. ConocoPhillips, in their first quarter 2004 report, stated that the U.S. refining margin increased almost 31 percent and that most of their overall corporate earnings came from the refining side of the business. And another report released in 2005, shortly before Hurricane Katrina hit, uh, showed that in August of 2005, refinery margins rose 54 percent and that those profit margins were responsible for 60 percent of the increased cost of fuel at the pump. Other studies uh, estimated that as much as two-thirds of the increased cost of gas at the pump is a direct result of profit margins of refiners. And immediately after Hurricane Katrina, Murphy Oil, a company with refineries impacted by the Gulf Coast, lamented the fact that it had refineries offline because it is missing out on, quote, record margins. And in your written testimony, you also contend that Congress can help by opening up areas which are off limits to new production. However, you leave out critical information about the lands which are available for leasing upon which there is no current production. In 2003, the Bureau of Land Management reported that 85 percent of the oil and 88 percent of the proven gas on federal lands in Colorado, New Mexico, Utah, Montana, and Wyoming were available for leasing and development. Of those areas which are currently available offshore, only 35 percent are currently in production. It is disingenuous, in my opinion, to argue that your industry needs greater access when it is not currently producing in areas already available. Do you have a comment? There are several points you brought up, Congresswoman. Uh, first, in terms of access, while you may have access for leasing, uh, there are a whole host of other restrictions post-lease that can prevent you from actually exploring. But irrespective of that, the ability to produce more oil and gas anywhere will increase supplies for whatever reason and potentially help consumers. Now, in terms of the refinery situation, this is a fundamental focus of markets at work. Refining margins go up, they go down. They were very low at the beginning of the year. They increase subsequently from that. But these are forces of supply and demand that affect the prices of crude oil, the prices of natural gas, and ultimately refining margins. And I would argue, I would also like to point out those are margins and not necessarily profits, because the margins themselves are gross margins for which you then have to deduct all the costs, and it's very difficult to see what happens. In the first quarter, for example, if you also put it in context, the oil industry in terms of earnings on the dollar made 9.1 cents on the dollar. Comparing that to all of manufacturing for 2006, which is the only data we have available right now, we don't have the first quarter, uh, you had taking out the car companies, which of course have had their struggles, uh, the average profit earnings margin for manufacturing industries was 9.5 cents on the dollar. So what we have is a situation. I, I where would I would also like to hear from our from our other witnesses, if possible. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think I got your, the gist of your comment. So you could start with Mr. Thomas, briefly. I'm going to pass. <laughs> uh, I'm not 100 percent sure of the question. Can you briefly? More of a comment. I mean, what uh, I was saying that actually we're we're finding that. Uh, you know, there are, there are lands available to conduct and, and produce, provide for more production, but there really hasn't been an effort on the part of the oil corporations or companies to do that. Right. You heard a little bit of that from, from one of our colleagues who left, Mr. Blumenauer, who said that the last uh, refinery or proposed permit that was actually issued was almost, what, several years ago, and um, the blame uh, 
or attempted blame was that the regulations were so onerous that kept the production from, from occurring from that facility coming, coming out in play. Um, that's not necessarily true, and uh, that's I, what we're trying to get to. Just, just a brief comment, and again, being from Louisiana where we have our fair share of offshore drilling going on, uh, there is a serious problem. There's still lots of area to further develop offshore, but there are a lot of state regulations as well as federal regulations, and you know, as much as we are trying to salvage our coast, there are a lot of problems in developing that area. General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from Oregon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank our witnesses today. I have enjoyed your comments and, and your testimony. Uh, more than 21 years, I have also been a small business owner um, with my wife. Uh, we are in the radio business. so. Our transmitters run on electricity, not oil, which is a good thing, at least unless there's a power outage, then they run on uh, LP gas. Um, but I, I, so I'm concerned about the economy, obviously. I understand, Ms. Estes, what you're saying, and Mr. Minternight and others about uh, what it's like to make payroll and, and take care of the people who work for you. It's not easy, and it's always challenged, and especially when you have uncontrollable costs. And uh, it's uh, radio business and small markets very reflective of the local economy, and we can't really push our costs up to somebody else either. And so uh, it, is a, it is a challenge with that. Let me, let me just ask you, Mr. Teske recommended a national portfolio, uh, energy portfolio standard, right? A, a requirement, a mandate that says every power company has to have a certain percentage of renewable energy in their portfolio, the percentage of which we might all argue about. There are some who would say, that in some regions of the country that will drive up the cost of energy because you'll be forced to perhaps buy a, a, a renewable energy source that is more expensive than what you're today getting. So, Ms. Estes, when we talk about, you, you've raised the question about additional costs in your business, is that direction from the government a mandate on what your local supplier has to buy? Does that affect you if your price goes up? Yeah, it affects me. It affects me through. Can you the, move that mic a little closer? That's why it cuts out on you. Sorry about that. Yes, it affects me. It not only affects me through my employees, it affects me through the supplies, through the materials, pretty much everything. Do I believe that we need to mandate and add more alternatives? Absolutely. Is it going to cost us? Yes. But in the long run, isn't it going to save well, us? Well, it might. And I, I guess that's, see, I come at it the other way, which is I'd rather have an incentive system. And in the Energy Policy Act of 2005, which we, some of us on this committee were on the other committee that wrote that and it's now law, that created the incentives, uh, for example, that are driving the production of ethanol by putting a dollar a gallon tax credit there, um, that are giving a 51 cent a gallon credit for agrobiodiesel development. And I'm, I assume those who are in agriculture have seen some benefit if you're on the growing end of it. I'll tell you the story about my cattle rancher. It cost him $100,000 a year more to finish off his herd because of the increased cost of corn. So he didn't think much ethanol out in Oregon because um, we're not raising a lot of corn out in Oregon. So, I mean, it, it has that effect. But that Energy Policy Act we passed put in law also has the incentives that it, uh, I think it's 1.9 cent a kilowatt hour to, to encourage uh, production of wind energy, geothermal energy, um, solar energy, half that credit for woody biomass. So I, I kind of come at it that I'd rather incent the market to go rather than arbitrarily um, demand and mandate uh, and drive your costs up and your costs. Um, that's, that's my own personal preference, but um, I, I don't know. Um, maybe I you want the mandated costs yeah. from here. We can pick 20 percent of all your power has to be green and then let you figure out how, but there are members of this committee opposed wind generation off their coasts. Um, we've got, uh, Dr. Dr. Felmy, uh, we, we talk about trying to be energy independent. Can you speak to the reserves that are here in the United States, in the uh, lower 48 and Alaska, and what that could do if we could access those reserves in terms of energy independence? In terms of undiscovered resources that uh, if we could have access to them, they could do a substantial amount uh, toward reducing imports. Uh, it's in excess of, I believe, 100 billion barrels of oil that could be available for developing that would uh, uh, go a long way to helping reduce uh, our import dependence. I want to go to the issue of refinery capacity, because I, uh, I gassed up in, in Brothers, Oregon, which none of you should ever uh, know about necessarily, because it's a very small little burg on the way between Burns and Bend. 
and various one pump and a diesel pump. And it was like $3.99 a gallon if my eyesight was right. And they'd sell me $15 worth because it's that kind of limited capacity, but it got me to the next town where I could gas up fully for three thirty-five. The The point is, though, I talked to a group of cattlemen that were in there, and they're concerned about this price because what it takes to run their pickups and haul their, their horses and cows and all. And they asked me about refinery capacity. And my, uh, some of my colleagues have raised this issue as well, and I'm concerned because I know your capacity has increased even though the number of refineries has been reduced. The refinery capacity itself through new technology has increased, correct? That's correct. How many companies own the refineries? Do you know? How consolidated is that market? Well, if you look at uh, the top eight refiners, I, I've looked at this in comparing it to Congre uh, Commerce Department uh, Census Bureau data. The share of total refining capacity is about two-thirds. Uh, and that compares to other industries that are large consumer products industries which have more concentration of ownership than the refining industry. So it doesn't look to me as though it is an overly concentrated, and I firmly believe it's a highly competitive industry. If it's highly competitive, the profit margins are fairly significant, even though the percentage, I understand, is 9 percent. But in many industries, 9 percent is not a bad margin to have. Um, why is it we're not seeing more uh, investors build refineries? I mean, we are on the bubble. I, I mean, uh, that's my sense after several years on these committees. The least little, the, the big storm in Louisiana knocks out a couple of refineries or a fire here or a, a breakdown there. Prices go through the roof all of a sudden. Uh, it, you know, why aren't we seeing more? Don't I have another minute to finish up here? Yeah. Uh, why aren't we seeing more refineries being constructed? Well, in terms of new refineries, I think Congressman Shadegg pointed out the difficulties of Arizona clean fuels in terms of all the hurdles they have to face. But the industry has expanded their refinery capacity, the equivalent of a new refinery for every year for the last 10 years within the gates, and their announcements indicate that you could see, as I believe in my testimony said, an additional equivalent of eight more refineries. But it's a cyclical business. The returns have not been good. And ultimately, if you want to invest, say, 2 or $3 billion in a new refinery, you have to assure returns to your shareholders. And is supply of the feedstock an issue domestically to get it refined? Or can you, do you have enough of the raw product coming in? Well, worldwide markets are fairly efficient, so you're able to usually attract imported crude oil uh, to be able to refine it into petroleum products, but it is more expensive, as uh, my testimony indicated. Time is up. Thank my you. My time's expired. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, thank you I'd Madam like to, Chair. Thank you. I'd like to recognize uh, Congressman Cleaver for seven minutes. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank all of you for, for being Thank you, Mr. Thomas, uh, for being here. I'm, I'm very much interested in the uh, school bus uh, issues, and I'm, 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 I look at our. I'm from, I'm, I'm from Kansas City, Missouri. I've looked at the fleet of school buses, and I know why they're yellow. We used to have red. We used to have red fire trucks, and we did a study and showed that yellow was better, much better seen. Um, but we've got to improve, I, I think, the, the look of the bus, buses, which is secondary to my real concern, which is, uh, what do you think the, the, the capacity of school districts would be if, by 2017, school buses were required uh, to have a fleet of bio diesel uh, buses uh, or hybrids. There's a 10 or 15 year uh, period for the, for the school districts to ramp up and, and get uh, uh, fuel efficient uh, vehicles. Well, the, the impact uh, because of the hybrids that we have available now 
uh, IC Corporation has uh, a hybrid out there that's being tested in several states, and the results are dramatic. There's a dramatic uh, decrease in uh, the uh, emissions, almost 90 percent, and there's a, a dramatic increase in its uh, fuel efficiency, at the miles per gallon that it would get. If the federal government would mandate that, certainly the industry would respond industry would just as they have responded with clean diesel and this is the first year where we've had to outfit the whole fleet with clean diesel engines uh, we would comply so the impact I think would be dramatic and positive thank you um, uh, mr. Uh, fill me um, the I'm, I'm uh, one of the co-sponsors of the federal price gouging prevention act that was mentioned earlier and I agree uh, with you that, that there may be some difficulty in defining unconscionably excessive. I think I could do it, but it, uh, you are in that industry. Could you give me uh, just your belief or figure for unconscionably excessive movement of gasoline prices? Congressman, as an economist, I, I can't do it. What we have seen over repeated increases in prices, for whether it be Hurricane Katrina or Rita or what we have experienced this year, is markets at work. And so I would be very concerned that if you were to put in an artificial definition, uh, however crafted, that it could have the unintended consequence, especially when combined with civil criminal penalties, jail time and so on, of traumatizing the market at a point where you actually need movements of supplies, you need to be able to attract imports, you need to be able to bring, uh, you need to have dem demand restraint and so on. I would just be very concerned well, that this could set us back to the, the price controls of the 70s, which were an unfortunate uh, episode we experienced. This act would not, would, not, um, would not prosecute anyone for the, the normal natural movement of prices. The market We'll, we'll, we'll deal with that, but what, what, what this legislation would deal with would be situations where uh, it, it, it appears based on, uh, uh, on either natural disasters or, or, uh, or other events that, that may not have had an impact uh, on the industry and yet the prices would, would, uh, would, would soar. And as members of Congress, I know you would I think you would agree that uh, that that it's diff difficult to I explain to the constituents. I th or, or I'd like to you, for, for you to give me some information on how to do it when you um, go home and people talk to you at your neighborhood meetings about a four hundred uh, million dollar bonus for uh, an executive for uh, Mobile Exxon. Uh, uh, Lee Raymond, and then they go in and look uh, in Kansas City. The average price of gasoline uh, today uh, is like uh, two dollars and ninety-two cents, and rising. And so, when you look at Raymond getting four hundred million dollars as an, as a retirement benefit, um, the people at, at at my town hall meetings are not interested in, in, in uh, me saying, well, the market is just kind of taking care of things and don't worry about it. I mean, you can, at least I hope, understand that people are angry out here. When, and, and someone mentioned it earlier, it was a $14 billion tax cut uh, for the oil industry, and then they re recorded the highest profits in the history of the planet. And so, it, you know, I'm not a bomb thrower. I, you know, I, I, I want to be able to sit down and have an intelligent discussion. The public is not inclined to be that patient right now. They're angry. And so can you, can you help me? Please. Well, Congressman, Congressman, we clearly know the frustrations of consumers. Uh, I can't comment on any individual company's compensation policies, but if you look at the size of that in the context of a 
multi-hundred billion dollar corporation, it really is insignificant in the scheme of things. It is that, largely, that won't work. That, I can tell but, you now. That won't work out, 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 on, out on Blue Ridge Boulevard in Kansas City. So give me something else. I mean, you can, I mean these people are having difficulty make, uh, earning $13 an hour or, uh, you know, they're working all day. And you start saying, well, that's not much money in the context of things. Um, and, and, Congressman, I understand that, but one has to put it in proper context, just as you need to put the overall earnings you know, of the industry in proper context, that they are, in, they are consistent with the earnings, as I mentioned earlier, with manufacturing industries. And we understand the frustrations of consumers. Unfortunately, time has expired. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to recognize uh, Congressman Sullivan for five minutes. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. And uh, in my opening statement, I wanted to submit these two uh, letters uh, into the record. I asked unanimous consent to do it. I didn't ask unanimous consent earlier. Without objection. Thank you. Um, you know, uh, you hear a lot about all this stuff, and I, I, admit, I admit, agree with you. I think that compensation is big, and I don't think saying that, you know, they, this insignificant is a good answer. It doesn't work, does it, out there? And, but, uh, but companies do what they do, and, and we can't control that. But, you know, I was going to ask, I guess, Mr. Felmy, um, you know, we have uh, gas prices are high, um, higher than usual. People are going to experience that probably more so this summer. And, you know, we, I'll, I guess I'll ask you, if, if we had more refineries, do you think that would help the prices? I think that any time you're able to increase the supply of any product, uh, whether it be gasoline or whether it be any other product, you help the market conditions. And do you think, Katrina, because of the geographical location, we, we didn't have much geographical diversity on our refineries in this country, really. A lot of them, I guess 40 percent or so, are down in, the, in that area uh, that was affected by Katrina and Rita. Did that have any impact on price, do you think, as an economist? Well, as an economist, we took a the industry took a body blow from refining capacity shut down, 25, 30 percent of capacity, pipelines were shut down, import facilities were shut down, production, complete production in the Gulf of Mexico was shut down. We had a real supply hit of all different dimensions. At the same time, you had increased demand leading into the Labor Day holiday. So there's no question we took a, a hit from both supply and demand, and what you saw markets respond as a result. Are, are you, sir, or anyone here? Does anyone have any evidence from the F or did the FTC or anybody have any evidence of any price gouging that occurred after Hurricane Rita and Katrina? Is there anything that we can point to that that's uh, just uh, overwhelming evidence that states that there absolutely was price gouging and collusion and and, and uh, price fixing? Did in, does anyone have anything they can say? I can I can answer from a personal experience. Uh, prices escalated. Somewhat in immediately thereafter, but uh, the state attorney general and the state put a uh, price cap so that no prices could be increased. You know, they, they froze prices where they were to try to protect people. The, 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 it was not necessarily a price problem as much as a su availability. The, you know, there, there were but, no places to obtain so the fuel. Mr. Knight, you, you, you experienced a great deal of adversity down there during all that. I heard you talking about it, and it was terrible. Um, and prices were high. But was anybody convicted? of price gouging down there? There may have been one or two isolated instances in some of the rural areas around the city, but in, in general, no. But probably like maybe if that happened, it was like an independent guy? Correct. Not like Exxon Mobil or anybody with a concerted effort to fix prices? No. In fact, in, uh, in most cases, the, some of the larger uh, corporations, the, the Shell and the, you know, the, those kind of places, worked diligently to try to get a few isolated stations open, provide a, a supply. And they were working with the emergency relief people also and providing fuel for them. Well, thank so. you. I know you've been through a lot down there. Uh, Dr. Filmy, have you, have you heard of any, uh, thing, any evidence by the FTC, any evidence by any body, state, law enforcement agency of, of conviction or, of, or suspicion or anything of any price fixing or gouging that's occurred in the United States of America? In terms of any type of uh, illegal activity beyond uh, the subjective price gouging, no. I mean, I think there probably were a handful of instances in, in a few states where individual owners perhaps uh, exercised poor judgment in terms of the results, but it certainly wasn't widespread, and uh, that's my recollection from what uh, the, the uh, discussion was. 
So there, I guess it's safe to say, though, we can, can say today in this hearing that there has never been evidence of any widespread price fixing or price gouging that has occurred in the United States of America through any of these companies with an organized effort to do that. Would that be safe to say? Everybody? Mr. Thomas, would you say? I think, I think that would be safe to say. Mr. Metternight? Not to my knowledge. Mr. Esky? Uh, I'm just a cynical little redneck from Kansas. I don't believe a bit of crap that comes out of the petroleum industry. Right, that's, but that's just my opinion. And that's America. You can say that, sir. Ms. Estes? Um, I was able to read both sides of it. And you asked if anyone brought literature. Yes, I did. Um, but I brought it about that thick. And to go through it, it's a ton of information. It goes both ways. For every article that says that there was, there's an article that says they're wrong. For every article that says that the price should be this, there's an article that says it's something else. So. For me to determine what's right, I can't tell you. I would need more than four days. Unfortunately, time has expired. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to uh, recognize Congresswoman Herseth uh, Sandlin for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairwoman. Um, thank you all for your testimony today. And before I pose some additional questions on this refining capacity issue, I do want to just clarify a few things. Uh, my friend, Mr. Walden from Oregon, and I see eye to eye on a lot of things, but I do want to sort of clarify what I viewed as important in the Energy Policy Act of 2005. The incentives that Mr. Walden referred to in terms of the dollar per gallon for biodiesel and the 51 cent credit on ethanol, those have been around for over 20 years, so these incentives. It was the renewable fuel standard as a mandate that, in my opinion, caused the mix of incentives, existing incentives, and ex expanding those, extending them in the Energy Policy Act, and the mandate, creating the market, imposing the competition that for years wasn't there, and I think attributes perhaps Mr. Teske to some of what we know uh, the attitude is in uh, farm country because of our difficulty of getting a market for ethanol uh, for a long time until we had that mandate. And since we've had that mandate, we have seen startup companies take off in the investment of new technologies to make the production process even more efficient, not just for corn ethanol, but increasingly cellulosic ethanol and the potential that has. And that leads me to this refining capacity issue, because we're focusing on refining capacity only for fossil fuels and petroleum products. But Dr. Filmy, would you agree that uh, along Mr. Sullivan's questions, because you did take this body blow, right, in terms of your import uh, ports, port of entry, the refining capacity being concentrated in a certain geographic region of the country, that it's not just increasing the supply of the product, it's having a decentralized and geographically diverse distribution system and, and where the refining capacity would exist? I'm not quite sure. Are, are you asking that you should that it would be preferable to have a geographically dispersed? Yeah, wouldn't that, in that? terms of how the market would the market function uh, more effectively in terms of insulating us from those types of body blows if geographically our refining capacity, either for petroleum products or refining capacity in biorefineries throughout rural America, would assist in? insulating us from those types of price fluctuations? Well, it would, it would likely help in terms of specific disasters such as hurricanes, which are, of course, concentrated in the Gulf of Mexico. There is, however, a trade-off with cost that when you get to a highly dispersed level of production, it can increase your distribution costs. So there is somewhat of a trade-off, but certainly to the extent that you don't have all your capacity located in one area that is vulnerable to hurricanes, that, of course, can help in terms of more supply reliability. But if highly dispersed and, be, and use more locally increased with flex fuel vehicles, that type of infrastructure, that would assist uh, consumers as well, correct? That would certainly lower the transportation costs versus uh, long-distance shipping, which can be quite expensive for ethanol because you can't include it in pipelines. And you had mentioned that um, over the years the industry has expanded refi existing refineries equivalent to one new refinery, but in doing so, hasn't that 
enhance the degree of concentration geographically of where we're, our refining capacity exists? You, yeah, you're expanding the existing within the existing fences. And so if you have a concentration there, then, of course, it increases more uh, of that capacity in an area. And that's unfortunate, but it's the only place we can locate the refineries right now. But isn't it also true that while you may have ex the industry may have expanded in certain existing refineries, there were a number of mergers uh, throughout the 1990s that led to closures of some existing refineries. Is that true? I don't think so much the mergers led to closures of refineries. I think what you saw is divestiture of those refineries actually to a whole new class of independent refiners who have gotten much larger. So, for example, uh, refiners such as Valero, who were much smaller, picked up assets from these divestitures. And so the concentration impact has gone up since 19... I guess the latest data, first data I have is 97 from around 49 percent to about 66, two-thirds roughly. Uh, but that still doesn't put it out of line with other industries in terms of supplying consumers. No, it doesn't. But uh, some of us share the same concerns about other sectors and industries like the livestock industry and the concentration there when we don't have the kind of competition. When you have that type of concentration uh, develop and the impact that that ultimately has on prices uh, for producers, for consumers, and on down the line. Um, I see my time is up, so I will... Uh, I'd yield back any remaining time, but I don't have it. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. I thank you. The gentlelady's time has expired. The gentlelady from Tennessee, Ms. Blackburn, is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Mitternight, I know a little bit about that area where you are from. I have a dad who, uh, 81 years old, just sold his oil field equipment business, worked in it every day of his life up until recently, down in southern Mississippi. I know Metairie, and I would imagine that you would probably agree with me that regulation is just choking the business down there, and I imagine you also would support one-stop regulation, uh, a one-stop shop for working with all these regulatory state and federal agencies to get these refineries up and running. I agree a thousand percent, uh, yeah. and there, there, there have been some negotiations between economic development people in Louisiana and some of the, the foreign countries to try to establish a new refinery, the first one in 35 right. years it would, in, in the country. It would go a long so way to solving the problem would, we have. Right. And sounds like uh, Mr. Teske and Ms. Estes would also like to get rid of a little bit of regulation that hampers a small business. Most, most of us small business people would. Mr. Mitternight, uh, on energy expenses, fuel costs, what percentage of the, your total business expense do you give toward fuel cost? It's fluctuating, but uh, right now, in my energy costs are probably six to eight percent of my six overall expense. Ms. Estes, how about you? What is your percentage? And the last year, in the last two years, about 1600 a month, and I've actually had but you one don't know. I, I just need a percentage. $1,600 a month doesn't really mean, uh, you know, there's Went nothing to balance that against. To 7, so, you know, uh, that would be helpful. Um, you know, you said your employees would like to have uh, a little bit of a raise to help offset some of those energy and fuel costs. I think most people in America would like to have, have that. And I uh, look forward to a day when our small businesses can be more taxation and regulation free so that they can enjoy that. Uh, you said you had a 7% profit margin? Yes. Okay. That's pretty good, isn't it? Um, for federal contracts? I think for most, I think for most small businesses, you know, you're running uh, twice the growth of the GDP. So that's a pretty good uh, profit margin, I would, I would think. So congratulations on having a 7% profit margin at the end of the year. Having been a small business person, you enjoy those years when you, when you do come out ahead. Um, Mr. Felmy, I know I'm going to run out of time and we're getting ready to have votes in a few minutes. There are others who want to ask questions. Uh, when I'm with my constituents in Tennessee, and we talk about the increase in uh, transportation fuels, the increase in electricity, and all of these energy costs. People turn around and they look at you and they say, you ought to be able to do something about this. 
federal government has been piling on regulation for years and years and years. Federal government increases our taxes. The gas tax goes up. It is not going to the highway fund. Now they are sending it over to research global warming. And they don't like that. I would love to hear from you as an economist what three or four things you feel like we could do that would actually make a difference in the price at the pump and the price that people are paying for energy, because I think that is part of the frustration. You know, we talk about things that need to happen short term, mid term, long term. We talk about conservation efforts. We talk about incentives. And all of those things, the Energy Act of 05, which has been referenced, did a good bit of that. And that is commendable. But people want to know what we could do that would actually help make that change. And I'd love to hear from that. And if I run out of time, if you would submit it to me in writing. Thank you, Congressman. Put simply, we need to increase supply. That means to increase supply of production of oil and gas in our own country, which would both stimulate the economy, lower our trade deficit, and help, the, help uh, economic activity. We need to streamline regulations so that we can more expeditiously expand refinery capacity or perhaps build a new refinery. Uh, and we need infrastructure to be put in place, whether it be pipelines or power lines or ports or terminals or everything that goes to actually getting that fuel to consumers. We are going to need more renewable energy. We are going to need more emerging energy technology to be able to help. And we are going to need more energy efficiency. So things that would help consumers in terms of more efficient vehicles, more efficient houses, more efficient operations will reduce the demand. That combined with increased supply can help consumers. Thank you, sir. I yield back. General, General Lady's time has expired. The Chair recognizes the gentleman from New York, Mr. Hall, for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and thank you uh, for your presence here and your discussion with us. I'm sorry I missed your opening statements. I was uh, booked in another committee at the same time. Funny how they do that. Uh, the good news I wanted to point out from the latest IPCC report that the ranking member mentioned in his opening statement is that there are plenty of currently available and affordable technologies and policies that can reduce global warming pollution and oil imports. As this committee is already discovering in the hearings we have held, and as Mr. Teske made clear, when it comes to global warming, the cost of inaction far outweighs the cost of action. Many of the smart actions we could take today, like raising CAFE standards, would save consumers money. And I wanted to ask, um, uh, I just wanted to ask Mr. Thomas, uh, you are probably familiar with this, my uh, home district, uh, one of the five counties I represent, Westchester County, is running uh, hybrid buses on their bus loops around the county. And, uh, and has there been any discussion that you have heard about combining that with, if you are running diesel hybrids, you can certainly run biodiesel hybrids. Sure. So there you are compounding one new technology with another, and it would seem to increase the uh, uh, the efficiency, or shall we say, the, the uh, to lower the demand for petroleum products. Exactly, we, we're very excited about it as an industry. Uh, the IC Corporation has taken the lead on this, and as well as West Westchester County, New York, and, and several other states, they've introduced uh, the hybrid, and we're, we're excited about the results. the The problem is, is that the cost of that vehicle is dramatically more than the cost of of today's uh, regular old clean diesel school bus. So we have to do something about coming up with the upfront cost to to offset the capital expense in order to get the emission and the, uh, the fuel efficiency benefits. But given the size of the overall yellow school bus fleet in the United States, which was amazing when I read about it in, in your uh, written comments, uh, wouldn't it be worth it in your mind uh, if the government were to incentivize or subsidize the upfront costs? And, and, and the uh, congestion mitigation air quality uh, formula funds that come out of the DOT would be a perfect avenue to do that. I'm driving a, uh, an American-made hybrid which shuts down the motor when you're at a standstill. So if a school bus is caught at a stoplight or in a traffic jam and suddenly stops pumping out fumes from diesel or biodiesel, that would contribute to air quality as well Certainly. as uh, reducing global and warming. And for every bus that's on the road, you have 50 cars that aren't. Right. Uh, so I just wanted to comment also on a remark that was made from a member on the other end of the bench here about companies do what they do. We can't control that, I think was quote unquote. The fact is that we do control that, that we regulate airlines, we regulate meatpacking companies, we regulate all kinds of, you know, when the public interest and health are 
or national security are at stake, we do uh, sometimes decide that it's um, in our interest to uh, regulate. And um, I just wanted to ask, uh, starting with Dr. Felmy, I guess, about the sort of um, rockets and feathers syndrome, that when petroleum prices or gas prices at the pump go up, they seem to go up fast, and then they seem to drift down more slowly like a feather. It's, it seems that my constituents are seeing that and talking to me about it. It doesn't seem to follow uh, the price of oil. And in fact, the gas that's already, the gasoline that's already in the ground at a particular gas station, the, the truck has already come and delivered it. And then you see the guy on his ladder up that night changing the numbers. I've driven to events and come back later the same night and the price was 10 cents higher. I'm just curious why it's always so fast to go up and so slow to come down. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. In, many, in some cases in the past, if you look, you've had perfectly symmetrical rises and falls. The public doesn't always recognize that, though. They tend to have a very visceral response to the price increases. But as they come down, and, and economic studies have verified this, you tend to have less shopping behavior, less discipline on the market, and so you, you sometimes see prices. Ultimately, it really is a function of why did the prices go up. If crude oil prices went up rapidly and gasoline prices followed and crude oil prices don't come down rapidly, then there's no reason to suggest why gasoline prices would because of the, the cost of production, producing uh, gasoline is most importantly tied to crude oil costs. In terms of the individual uh, gas station owner, 95 percent of the stations roughly are owned by independent businessmen who make their own decisions about what the price is. They do that as a function of the market for the gasoline based on their, their local conditions and the costs of what they, they spend it along with a lot of other things that they take into account. Um, their decision about the price is not necessarily tied to what they paid for the gas in the pump. Generally, we have heard from, for example, the, the dealer organizations that it's more of a replacement cost that is a challenge for them. As an independent businessman, if he sees the price going up dramatically, has a feeling that the cost of gasoline is going to be much higher, then he's concerned about not having the cash flow to be able to buy that next uh, uh, tank load of gasoline. Thank you, Mr. Fellamy. I'm sorry. My time has expired for my other questions. I yield back. Okay. The gentleman's time has expired. What we're going to do now is ask the witnesses if they'll each give us the one minute they want us to remember about skyrocketing uh, gasoline and oil prices. And, uh, and we, th we thank each of you for uh, testifying here today and your one minute summation of your views on this. Uh, um, it comes right out of the bottom line, which impacts salaries and everything else. So it is a, is a dire situation for small businesses to compete with. Mr. Teske. Uh, thank you. Uh, as I said earlier, I'm pretty cynical about what I hear. There's been enormous amounts of wealth taken out of the agricultural segment that's going other directions now. And uh, I've never seen anybody that's been short of fuel. Whatever place you go to buy gas, they'll sell it to you. <laughs> so I, I, I'm puzzled. I mean, I, I, I don't quite understand the concept. So. My ideal world would be every farmer having his own wind turbine where he goes and plugs his tractor in at night and he's completely off the grid and off the petroleum. That would be my perfect world. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I agree on the fact that the firm fixed price, there's not much we can do about it. What my concerns are, and the one thing I'll leave with you is the American public. Um, the effects that it's having on the lower class they can't afford any increases, and that is my main concern. You're creating anger and poverty. Dr. Felmy. The current gasoline s situation is clearly a function of markets at work. Higher costs to manufacture gasoline, crude oil costs, ethanol costs, summer blend fuel that's coming in, marry that to market conditions with strong demand for gasoline, uh, a supply challenge because of lower imports. The refiners have responded by producing record amounts of gasoline, but we still have a tight market, and it is that movement of the market that allows supplies to be able to divert it where they are needed and doesn't, allow, doesn't uh, foster gas lines that we have experienced in the past. Thank you, Dr. Felmy, very much. Um, all I can tell you is that your testimony was really excellent, and um, uh, especially um, the ordinary citizens who came here to Washington. I mean, it's right out of central casting. You, you really did a great, great job. Um, we're committed to uh, 
answering this question. Uh, we have to change our behavior here in the United States. We have seen a doubling of the price of gasoline over the last 10 years. Uh, it is unsustainable if it goes to $4 a gallon. In other words, the price of not doing something is much, much higher than the price of doing something. It has already gone up uh, a buck and a half, and it is heading towards two and a half bucks that it will have gone up over the last 10 years. So now we have to change direction. We have to innovate. We have to ensure that the automotive sector, uh, that uh, every sector uh, changes and that we take the revenues that we have been sending into the oil and gas industry and we begin to redirect them towards the renewable energies, towards the innovative new technologies uh, that can uh, change the direction in this country. That will be our task, including our goal of passing legislation that outlaws price gouging by oil companies in this country and to do it this year. We thank each of you for your uh, testimony. With that, this hearing is adjourned.